Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with Gary Klein, who is the founder of Shadowbox LLC. We'll talk more about what Shadowbox does, but um, you're also the author of a, of a bunch of books. Um, man, the first one that, that I remember came out a long time ago, 25 years ago, is called uh, Sources of Power, How People Make Decisions. Uh, and then we also have um, Streetlights and, and Shadows, Searching for the Keys to Adaptive Decision Making, and also uh, The Power of Intuition. This one called Seeing What Others don't, and the most recent book is called uh, Snapshots of the Mind, which is really a, a collection of short essays, which kind of ranges through your entire uh, history of work, plus a couple of, of new insights. And, and I guess these were kind of targeting a more, I don't know, popular audience through your, your column and, and, and blog. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I think well, the thing that I found most, in, I teach courses in um, behavioral economics, JDM, uh, data and decisions and innovation. And so, you know, I've had an opportunity to reference your work quite a bit in, in my teaching. Um, but what I found really interesting is how you characterized what you're doing as positive cognitive psychology. <laughs> I think the, the reference of course, is to, you know, Marty Seligman, uh, and his whole, um, movement, which was called, you know, positive psychology, which was meant to complement the, the, you know, the focus on, um, I guess, defects and flaws in our, in our psychology, which was prevalent in the world of psychology. And then within the world of decision-making, particularly um, with the rise of the bias, bias and heuristic school, right? Kahneman, Tversky, et cetera. The focus has been on the flaws in, in our judgment, the flaws in our decision-making. And you want to emphasize and highlight well, the positive aspects and how, you know, we, we, we're pretty darn good when it comes to making decisions. And in fact, there, there are um, some cases where we do these phenomenal things, right? Like where we, we, we gain insights and, and we, we process enormously complex amounts of information in ways that we are, are still struggling to, to replicate with things like artificial intelligence. So anyway, how did you come up with this, this idea of, of, of positive cognitive psychology? And, and is this meant to sort of be coextensive with, with naturalistic decision-making or is it, uh, you know, a broader notion of how we should approach decision-making? I think it's a broader approach, but it certainly fits in with, with the whole naturalistic decision-making movement that we started back in 1989. Uh, and how did I come up with it? Gosh, I don't know. Uh, I think, I think it was because of the work that we were doing with firefighters and they were really good <laughs> and they were able to make good decisions in just a few seconds of arriving at a, at a fire scene and all the leading, uh, research suggested that the only way to make good decisions was to set up a decision matrix, look at all the options, evaluate them on a common set of dimensions, see which one came out ahead, and that it was going to take at least a half hour to set up one of these matrices. The firefighters didn't have a half hour. The fire was growing exponentially. So they got there and they quickly knew what to do. And the question was, how did they, how did they know? And we didn't know. Uh, so we, we just wanted to explore it. Uh, and we thought maybe they're, they're not looking at a whole range of options. Maybe they're just, just looking at two options, a favorite and a, a, another one. They weren't looking at any comparison between the options. They just were able to use their expertise. And so that shifted us into thinking about how does expertise relate to decision making? And that turned out to be a very fortunate question because the, the the decision research community didn't really study expertise. They studied decision making in controlled laboratory environments with artificial tasks, with minimal context, with college sophomores as the subjects, and they, they deliberately didn't want to investigate expertise. 
because expertise in those studies would produce variability. If they gave people tasks that they were familiar with, some people would be more familiar than others and you'd get more variability. And that meant you'd get uh, have a harder time trying to come up with uh, significant results. So they said, let's give people tasks they've, n they've never seen before. So everybody starts at zero. Well, that's different from our firefighters who had over 20 years of experience. And I remember once I was at a conference and I was presenting my findings and one laboratory researcher raised his hand and said, I give my subjects lots of experience. I give them 10 hours of practice. And I thought, 10 hours, 20 years? We're, we're, ta we're not talking about the same sort of thing. So we, we, were, we were interested in what people's skills and ability were. And that was where we got up with, came up with sources of power, which is what people know. And, and it it's, does relate to, to Seligman's work about positive psychology. And we said, let, let's look at the positive end of how, what people's strengths are as they make decisions. And that's, that's what got us started. And we started categorizing what the strengths were. Now I have a confession to make, even though I have this model of, of people, of how people make decisions uh, called an RPD, a recognition prime decision model. I've never taken a course in decision making. And that wasn't the subject when I went to graduate school. Uh, so I was blissfully ignorant of everything that was going on. But what I did have was a background in expertise because in the mid seventies, I was working at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base on, and it was the Arab oil embargo. And uh, uh, pilots weren't able to fly all the, the, amount, the, the amount that they wanted that they were used to. And they were gonna have to be trained in simulators, which they always looked at as toys up to that point. And so we were trying to figure out what needs to happen in a simulator to build their skills. And that raised the issue of how do they gain expertise and what is expertise? So from that point on, my background was really on the nature of expertise. And then I just applied it to decision-making. And I said, how do people use their background, their experience in order to make these wonderful decisions under crushingly limited time pressure, lots of ambiguity and uncertainty, yet they could do it. So that's, that's really where, where, where it all got started. Well, so if, if we want to dig into the contrast between your, your domain and expertise, uh, I mean, your domain and your, your methods and the domain and methods of say the, the, the JDM world, I mean, part of it is that you're interested in studying experts while they're interested in, in studying people more generally, but also in terms of methods, um, you don't do your work primarily in the lab. You, you do it in, in the field. And, you know, it seems almost like anthropology to some degree. I mean, you know, you, you, because you don't just simply observe the behavior, you, you want to kind of get at the, the cognitive processes that are at work. And, and this often requires you to do, you know, interviews, right? But, but a lot of times these people, they, they don't really know what they're, what they're doing, right? How can you figure out right? What the cognitive processes are if, if, if people themselves, right, don't understand it because most of this is, is tacit knowledge. Exactly. And by the way, we, we are also interested in people who aren't experts. So we're not just looking at experts. We're looking at everybody and we're interested in how expertise develops. Uh, so that, that's part of it. So how do we do it? Oh, at the beginning, we, we didn't know. We were just making it up. This was research that we were doing in the mid-1980s. And we, we said, we'll study firefighters because they have to make tough decisions under time pressure. The Army had, had issued a, a, a proposal announcement about wanting to know how people make decisions under time pressure and uncertainty. And I think most of the people who applied who try to get funded said, I'll just take a standard laboratory task and vary the time pressure and vary the uncertainty. And we said, let's talk to people who really do it for a living and, and see what we can learn from them. And we didn't have any idea. 
So we thought we would just watch them and we would station ourselves in firehouses and ride with them. And we did some of that and that was fun. But we're in a bad era right now for that kind of work because with all the safety codes, there aren't that many fires. So we were going to be wasting a lot of time, not really gathering much data. So we said, let's ask them about their tough cases. And we developed this cognitive interviewing technique, cognitive task analysis, to try to identify how they how they are, are, are handling the time pressure and the uncertainty. And you're exactly right. Expertise is really built largely on tacit knowledge. And if it's tacit knowledge, people can't readily explain it or can't explain it at all. So that's a challenge. It was a challenge for us then. It's still a challenge for us now. And that's what makes it interesting. So I remember the one of the first firefighters I interviewed, he had made a decision and he said it was because he had ESP <laughs> perception. And, and, and I was there to interview him about tough cases. And he said he really didn't have any except this one. And it was 14 years earlier. I didn't want to interview him about a, a 14 year old episode, but that's all he could remember. And I had booked him for a two hour slot. So I said, okay, tell me about the episode. So he described what happened. He was a, a, a young uh, junior officer. He led his crew into a fire. It was a simple situation. It was a single family house. There was a fire in the back. He looks at it and he said, it's where the kitchen is. It's a kitchen fire. Brings his crew in through the, through the front door, through the living room, brings the hose, hits the fire in the kitchen. And then they, they, they back off and the fire comes roaring back. Now that surprised him. So he said, let's hit it again. And they hit the, what they thought was the seat of the fire and it came roaring back. And they retreated from the kitchen back into the living room. And then something told him, this is a bad place to be. And he told his crew, everybody out. And everybody started to scramble to leave. Some people were jumping through windows. And as they were doing it, the floor where they had been standing, the floor collapsed. Had they stayed there another minute or two, they would have been dropped into the basement because the fire was in the basement. They didn't even know there was a basement. And he said that was ESP. And that just showed him that he has ESP and he could rely on it to save him for the rest of his career. And that was his story. Now, what do you do with something like that? So I didn't know. I had never encountered something like this. So I asked him, tell me what you were noticing. And he said, well, there we were in the living room. And we were surprised because what we thought was should have happened, the fire should have dimmed down, but it, it had our water had no effect on it. So we, we didn't know what was happening. So we retreated in the living room. I said, what else were you noticing? He said, it was awfully hot. Well, he didn't know that the fire was in the basement right below him. He just knew that it was awfully hot. And I said, uh, how did you know it was, it was hot? And he said, he always leaves his ear flaps down. His ears would get burned, but that was an indicator of, of, of what the temperature was. They didn't have the, the technology they do today. And I said, what else were you noticing? And he said, fires are noisy but I wasn't hearing much noise and that surprised me. And as we pieced it together, we realized there were a number of different factors that didn't fit together within his expertise, within his experience. That's why he told his crew to leave. He didn't have ESP. He had expertise and he came and encountered a situation where his prior experience didn't fit and he knew something was wrong and something was dangerous. And by the end of the interview, he realized he didn't have ESP and he wasn't happy. He had just spent the last 14 years thinking he was invulnerable because he was protected by his ESP. And in fact, he wasn't, he was protected, protected by his knowledge and his expertise. So that, that's an example where he couldn't tell us why he made the decision. He thought it was ESP, 
But if we asked him what the pieces were, we were able to work with him and put the pieces together and figure out the story. So that's that's the way we do the interviews. Gary, I'm, I'm going to ask you real uh, quick. If you can disable your um, uh, your notifications, I don't know if you know how to do that. You go into the uh, lower right-hand corner of your um, computer, and there's a little bell, and you can just click on that little bell. and uh, Lower and say, right-hand corner? I don't yeah, know. Very, I, I, go ahead. The lower right-hand corner next to where the, the clock and the date is? In your uh, on your computer, if you have a PC, there's a. I have a Mac. Okay, I don't know how you do it in Mac. I think well, I know in the PC you go to the lower right hand corner, where the time and the date is, and there's a little alarm bell, and you can click on that. You see, um, you see that? I have tried to do this in the past. I actually, I, I've encountered this problem in the past and failed. So I'm I'm sorry yeah. about that. Okay. All right. Well, we can we can plow through, um, and just hope there aren't too many announcements coming through. Okay. <laughs> but and we'll just try to try to delete them out. But okay, we'll resume. Sorry. No worries. Um. So look, in this intuition, or this, I mean, let me start over. So expertise. I mean, it's it's it is this it's kind of like an intuition or a sixth sense, which is why I guess he called it ESP. But, but isn't one of the reasons why we're interested in, in kind of teasing out, you know, what constitutes expertise is so that we can democratize it, right? So that you don't need to be an expert in order to do this. So, you know, after you debriefed this firefighter, you could kind of convert that expertise into a, a checklist, right? So that a, a beginner firefighter could kind of say, okay, when I detect it's quiet, and, and, you know, and, uh, and I feel hot, then, okay, maybe I need to do the following, right? I mean, and then once that becomes sort of commonplace knowledge, then, you know, expertise goes after the next thing, like the next more complicated thing. And, you know, it's always in the frontier. Yeah, I, I don't think that would work because there, there are so many complications and so many contextual factors that it would it would really take an awful lot to compile all of those things. What you can do is you can tell these stories. And so the, what you're doing is providing people with vicarious experiences. So this is a story about heat and quiet, and, and, and that's part of the lessons from, from this story, but the more important lesson is paying attention to anomalies, to that often when we think we know what's going on, there'll be some anomalies and our tendency is to explain these away. We sort of fixate on what we thought was happening and we explain away or ignore the anomalies. And usually the anomalies are just anomalies, so that makes sense, but sometimes they're not. And the anomalies are, are can be hints that we've we've called it wrong. And if we've called it wrong, there should be more and more anomalies and more to explain away. And that can become a different mindset about how to react to anomalies. So there, there's a variety of lessons to be drawn, even from a single incident like this. And we've done research on the use of stories in organizations to help people gain expertise by listening to the stories of others, gaining vicarious experiences. Now you've talked about how expertise is under attack. And, you know, I've got to, I've got to plead guilty here because in, in some of my classes, you know, I start off with the, the Billy Bean story, right. You know, from, from Moneyball. And, um, and I think there was a movement, right. A fairly significant movement in a lot of industries to, try to re replace people who had, you know, experience who were operating from their gut with, you know, statistical methods, right. And uh, to use machine learning, right. To kind of replicate what these folks uh, were doing. And uh, I even know somebody who started a financial institution and he brought in a whole bunch of loan officers, had them look at all these different applications and, 
And he just sort of tracked what they were doing. And after he observed them for about a year, he just fired them all and said, okay, now I know what you're doing. And now I can have the, the machines do it, right? Um, except for the difficult cases, in which case I still need them, right? But, you know, I'll figure out a way to, I just need to do some feature engineering and, you know, ultimately kind of maybe a little bit of anthropological interviews to figure out what they're looking at. And then I can kind of replicate what, what they're doing. I mean, is well, this... Listen. Can, can you tell me the name of that company so I can short it on the stock market? <laughs> well, it did it did uh, go out of business and, and get acquired. <laughs> so just saying. But I mean, is, is, is that really an attack on expertise or is it really an effort to kind of smooth out some of the, you know, the the flaws in over-reliance on, on gut, right? So in a way, it's an attack on expertise because he fired all the experts. If that's not an attack on expertise, I don't know what is. Second, it's an attack on expertise because he was insensitive to the kinds of tacit knowledge that the, these, these, these people had. And he thought he, he could just sort of strip mine it and go for the, uh, uh, the easily observable uh, explicit knowledge that he could get from them. And as you point out, experts have trouble articulating tacit knowledge because it is tacit knowledge. And let's go back to the Billy Bean example with the Oakland Athletics and Moneyball. Uh, which claimed that, that the old line uh, baseball scouts and, uh, and coaches were uh, ignoring the data and just going on gut feel. Well, that's not true, because if you look at what they were doing, um, they were using the, the statistical data that they had. They were using things like batting average. And we now know that batting average is... Uh, um, is a flawed measure that it doesn't take into account walks, for example. That was part of the what, what they learned. And when we have better better statistics now, so it's not as if the, these people were ignoring the statistics. They were using the best statistics that they had, and the statistics were were were, uh, were limited and and distorting. So they were given, the book was giving a, a wrong interpretation. Uh, to to what these scouts were doing, but but you also point out that maybe there's a there's a false dichotomy at work here, right? And that ultimately, the best decision making comes from experts who leverage the use of some of these techniques, right? I'm not saying that these techniques aren't aren't valuable, but uh, people ask me when when should you trust your intuition? And the answer is never, because intuition can mislead you. But that doesn't mean you should trust analytical methods either, because they can mislead you as well. So you you need to be able to, to use both. For intuition, you don't want to totally trust your intuition, but you want to at least listen to your intuition, because your intuition is maybe telling you some things that aren't captured in the analysis. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you talked about this thing called the what is it? The second singularity, right? I think that was the term you used. And, yes. um, and, and I think what, what you're suggesting is that, look, if we try to go with say level four autonomous driving, it's, it's going to be a, a, a disaster, right? You used examples from, from Air France. I mean, the Air France example is one that's, that's particularly troublesome, right? Mm -hmm. Where these pilots, uh, they're, expertise had been degraded by the reliance on, on automation. And so, you know, if, if, if perhaps there was a younger pilot on the U S air flight, then Sully, they would not, might not have been able to land, <laughs> land the plane. So, I mean, is, is expertise being, I don't know, gutted from, from the inside in, in some of these systems, um, which would ultimately mean that if we're going to move towards automation, we need to move, we, we need to wait until we can really somehow move it to say level five in, in the world of cars. Right. So you and I have different perspectives on it because you're looking for automation to work. And I am thinking in even in a task like, like driving, you encounter things that, 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 that wouldn't have been, programmed in or that the machine learning w wouldn't have 
uh, wouldn't have handled. And, uh, and, and that's why what we have, even though we've been promised self-driving cars, we don't have it. And we, and we have the communities that have undergone the trials walking back because it's, it's too risky. My friend Ben Schneiderman and I have, have written about this, and there's an essay on that in, 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 that, in the book, uh, Snapshots of the Mind. And we said, instead of trying to build machines that are smarter and smarter, we should be trying to build machines that make us smarter because we're the ones who have the, the responsibility for our decisions. So let's, let's build machines that uh, can collect all kinds of data and provide us with, with an, a trend analyses that we wouldn't be able to, uh, to capture. I have an example of uh, 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 an article that I read and I, I've talked to the, the lead author was looking at emergency departments and identifying uh, patients who were at high or low risk of cardiac in incidents. And they could look at thousands and thousands of different variables. So they had a very complex uh, system uh, based on machine learning. Uh, and they were very happy with it and they could outperform the, the physicians, but they had a machine learning system, but the physicians weren't in a position to learn anything at all because it's very hard to get feedback in an emergency department. And uh, the, this machine learning project, even though they had thousands of variables, there were only about 15, maybe 20 variables that really mattered. And I thought, if, if, if you pinned it down that way, why not tell the physicians what these variables are and let the physicians in on the secret rather than make it a competition between uh, the, the machine and, and, and the human? So they, they didn't take, at least in this, uh, at that point in, in their article when they published, didn't take that next step of how to build um, uh, machine learning systems that can be uh, supportive and, and can enhance the decision making of the of, of the attending physicians. Now I know you were you're involved with DARPA uh, in the work on um, explainable AI, and um, this is one of the things I talk about in, in my data science class, which is that you know while some of these models, the more complex they get, the the greater the predictive accuracy they get in certain domains. Um, you lose something if you don't really know what's going on inside the black box. It's difficult to gain any kind of insight, and it's difficult to know where those those flaws might be, right, or what environments in which they won't operate if you don't have the ability to to stress test them. You don't know where to stress test them because you don't know what it's actually doing. So, I mean, how how important is it that we make our models capable of of telling us what they're doing? Uh, it certainly would be nice if they could tell us what they're doing, but they can't <laughs> because they're machine learning systems and even their creators don't know what's going on inside them. Once I, uh, w during that project, it was explainable artificial intelligence that we were working on. And there was one group that had a system and they were very happy with it. It could look at a photograph and uh, identify uh, it's a hamburger and uh, you know, ju just see where, or, or ident identify broccoli. So they, they had trained it to be able to identify broccoli on a photograph of, 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 of a dinner plate. And they, they showed the, the, the heat map of, of, you know, where it really glowed around the broccoli. So I was looking at it, it was impressive because these things always impress me, I've got to be honest. But then I noticed there was some pixels on, on the hamburger that were also uh, lighting up with, 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 with the heat map display. And I said, well, that's not a broccoli. Why, why is that happening? And, and they, they looked around and they said, we won't do that ourselves. And only <laughs> about a week or so ago, we realized certainly it's not the color because broccoli is green, the hamburger was brown. It's not, not the shape because the broccoli has the florets and the hamburger is, is pretty, pretty round. And they said, it must be the texture. It must be that the texture of the florets and the texture 
of the hamburger at this point must have uh, must have synchronized. So they were happy that that they were able to figure it out, but it wasn't easy to do it. So um, I. Th- I don't see a lot of a, a lot of hope about having these uh, uh, advanced uh, deep neural nets ex- explain how they do things because it's a, all these different layers and all these different correlations are going on simultaneously, and it's just too. It was hard in the old days of expert systems. That was the problem with those with those systems, as simple as they were. They couldn't explain why they were making certain decisions so that physicians, for example, couldn't use them because they didn't know why. And today it's much, much more difficult or almost impossible. So what we've done is we've developed some tools to we call artificial intelligence quotient, AIQ, to make people smarter about the systems they're using by gathering, uh, helping them, we, we build a cognitive tutorial. We just did this with a, a machine learning system for, for translations to be able to, to help people understand how does, it, how does your system work uh, at a level you, you, can, you can follow but, so that we're building their mental model. But a mental model isn't just how does it work. A mental model includes what are its limitations? Where is it likely to break down or run into trouble? And a mental model for experts includes how do I do workarounds when it breaks, when it starts to run into its limitations? What can I do instead? And a mental model includes understanding where people might get confused when they use it so I can anticipate that. So we're using that broader concept of a mental model to build a cognitive tutorial for people using these systems. And and we have other tools as well. And these are not computational systems. These are representational systems so that people who who have to use AI programs and supports can do it more effectively and, and more safely and effectively. Right. So these, some of these models, they can't explain what they're doing. Some of these humans can't explain what they're doing, but it it seems that one of the advantages, at least of of the human expertise is that it is more robust out, out of sample, right? In other words, if the machine learning has not seen things that resemble the training data, right? In, in some way, it, it, it doesn't often, it often doesn't know what to do. Whereas these human experts, they can engage in, you know, speculative reasoning. I think you, you exactly. highlight. Exactly. And that's one of the hallmarks of, of humans and particularly experts is to engage in speculative reasoning when you've gone beyond what, what they've encountered before. And in fact, that's one of the ways that we distinguish experts from journeymen is you throw something at an expert that, that the expert hasn't seen before and their eyes light up and they say, what can we do about this? Whereas a journeyman says, huh, I don't know. I'm going to have to call somebody else in. And they get, they get uncomfortable rather than enthusiastic. So yes, as people become more skilled, they, they love the challenge of having to engage in speculative reasoning. That that's a human capability and, and a human source of power. Now you you spent a lot of time doing training programs, right? Trying to help these journeymen become experts a, a bit more quickly, right? With perhaps a little bit less experience than the experts have had to acquire. How can you do that, right? I mean, how how can you w- without converting the the tacit knowledge into explicit knowledge, how can you get people to become better, more expert-like decision makers in their domain? Right. And, and we, we don't think it's going to be productive to, be, to, to try to get as much, uh, to, to unpack as much of the tacit knowledge as possible and, and provide it in, in, in that form. So we provide it in a narrative form, in a, in a story-based form. And we developed a technique called shadow box. Actually, 
we didn't develop it. It was developed by a, a friend of mine, a firefighter, a New York Fire Department a guy named Neil Heinz. And here's how Shadowbox works. Um, I give you a tough scenario. And as we go through the scenario, I'll pause it. I'll stop the action. And I'll say, all right, Greg, at this point, here's four courses of action. Rank order which one you would want to do, top, second, third, or fourth. Rank order them. And then write down your reason why you rank ordered, ranked them that way. Then we continue the scenario and we stop it again. And we might say, all right, at this point, here's three goals. Rank order how important each of the goals uh, strikes you as. And you rank order it and you write down why you ranked it that way. And then we continue on and we might say, here's five pieces of information. Rank order the, imp the importance of each of those five pieces of information and why. And we've had a small group of experts go through the same exact scenario. And they've done their ranking and they wrote down what, what they ranked. And so when you go through the scenario and you do your ranking, we can immediately say, here's what the experts rank. And you want your ranking to match the experts. But the real learning comes in looking at the reasons that the experts put down. And because the reasons are a clue to the expert's mental model. And you're looking at your reasons, and then you're looking at what the experts noticed, the inferences they drew, the worries that they surfaced. And so you're building a stronger mental model by going through, uh, through the, the shadow box scenario. And what we find is within a half day, people's rankings match that of the expert by about 25% more compared to the beginning of the training. So that, that's the way we, we train people to see the world through the eyes of the experts without the experts having to be there. Because the experts are expensive. They're hard to, to get access to the experts, but we've got their responses to the scenario and we provide that to you as feedback. So it's, it's kind of like the case method, right? To some degree, the way we teach it in, in business school. It's very much like the case method and it, it marries the case method with looking at the decision points within the case and then ha packaging the expert choices and reactions plus the experts rationale. So we get, we get into, into that level of, of, of detail. And this is something that people can do on their own so they can be trained on their own. Although it, it's, it's often maybe even more productive to do it in small groups mm -hmm. and have a, a trained facilitator work with the groups. Yeah, you mentioned a couple examples in in the most recent book. One of which had to do with the Marines and and how they improved their decision making through exposure to methods like this. And then the other one was, uh, you know, using simulation, right? So this was the the Rio Tinto uh, group. Um, to, to what extent can can simulation kind of accelerate the acquisition of of expertise? I I, I recall hearing a story about um, flight attendants and, and how they, at Singapore Air, they would take these safety quizzes and they all passed the safety quiz with flying colors. But then when they put the goggles on and they did the, the there was a fire on, on the uh, virtual plane, none of them knew what to do, right? They were all panicking because the, you know, the, the checklist <laughs> that they scored really high on uh, di didn't really help them in that, in that emergency. Right. And uh, so the group that I'm really impressed with is uh, WTRI and, and Leah DiBello and uh, Dave Lehman and Sterling Chamberlain. And they build wonderful simulations, but it's not trivial to build a wonderful simulation. You have to be really smart. And these guys are really smart. And you have to understand the nuances of expertise and include that in the simulation. So the simulation really gives the person a, a workout. Now, in many situations, people build these simulators and the simulators 
have lots of physical fidelity. They, they really look like the real thing and the developers are very happy with them. But they haven't really paid attention to how they're going to train people. They're, they're just building the, the artifact because they know that's what they can sell to the government or to the major corporations. And so they're building these fancy, expensive simulators and people only have a chance to be in the simulator twice a year, three times a year. That's what I like about Shadowbox is you have all these scenarios and people can 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 go through these scenarios on, on their own laptop and some aspects they can go on, on uh they could use their their cell phone. So they they could be training all the time, not just on these special occasions. Now, look, if we want to teach people to become better decision makers, is there, is there an all-purpose way to do this? I mean, look, if you want to teach somebody to be a great firefighter, I mean, that's specific to the domain. If you want to teach somebody to be a great Marine, right, that's presumably specific to the domain. But are, are there some, you know, general principles that we can apply to the teaching of good decision making um i mean look i offer a course where i go through and try to get people to recognize all of the flaws in their decision making right following the the, the standard playbook right where we learn about all the different biases and 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 heuristics right and uh where where they steer us wrong um is is there a better way to do that or is there one that you know is more comprehensive that that complements that approach it's a great question and i've got three different answers so the first answer is is the one that i'm the most comfortable with is no there's not you can't make somebody generally a better decision maker it has to do with the environment and that's why simulators or these shadow box scenarios put people in specific situations so that or you know firefighters learning about situations and and gaining experience there so that's the answer i feel the most comfortable with however there's a second answer which maybe will give you more comfort i think there are some general principles to make somebody smarter in a domain this is something that Danny Kahneman and I have written about. Uh, to build intuitive expertise, you need to use feedback. And people just don't take advantage of feedback. And so you can be deliberate about it and say, here's, here's where I want to develop skills. What kinds of feedback can I get? And then how can I diagnose the, the the information I'm getting from the feedback and use that to build a richer model. So that's one general principle. Another general principle is one that I talked about before, the tendency people, some people have to fixate on the initial impression they have. And I, I want people to jump to conclusions. That's part of our skill. That's part of our expertise. I just don't want them to be stuck on those initial impressions. And to get to to get unstuck means being sensitive to anomalies, things that don't fit your your hypothesis, and be curious about it. And so I think that's a different mindset than people often have, which is to hold on to their initial hypothesis. So that's my second response. My third response, I don't know if you like either one of them, you're going to certainly not like my third one. My third one is I'm not a fan of the heuristics and biases approach. And I think in many ways, it's a distortion of what Kahneman and Tversky originally did. They weren't setting out to show how stupid people were or how flawed their decisions were. That was just the way they could design their experiments to demonstrate that people used heuristics. And they demonstrated it by, by showing in this environment where a heuristic is likely to mislead you, you will still use the heuristic even if you get the answer wrong. And that's how they, they could demonstrate that people were using the heuristic. Not that the heuristic was a bad heuristic. If you took away all of our heuristics, we would be helpless. So this was just the way they set up their experiment 
but then many people in the community just couldn't resist the temptation of saying, look how biased people are and started to build catalogs of all the biases. The last catalog I saw had over 80 different biases people are, are, are prey to. And I think I, I wrote an essay about positive heuristics. I'd like to see more people look at the way heuristics help us and give us quick responses and let us function in the everyday world and, and use that research as a basis for thinking about how people develop and use what I originally called back when I wrote my, my book in 98, how they use sources of power. Because I think that's, that's, an, that's an important dimension is to look at the positive aspect rather than the negative aspect. And that doesn't mean I wanna be a Pollyanna and say people don't mistakes make mistakes because people clearly do make mistakes. But if we just are looking at, at these mistakes, we're sending the wrong message. And that's part of the message about, uh, about disqualifying experts where people are delighted to show that experts can be tricked. Yes, of course they can be tricked, but still in all, if you're in a complex situation, you wanna believe hear what the experts have to say. Well, I mean, isn't that just a, a call for, for practical wisdom, right? Understanding boundary conditions, right? Understanding when and where it makes sense to rely on different decision making methods, right? Sure, you, you, you'd like to encourage that, but right now it's uh, the call is on developing um, statistical methods that can outperform the experts. And so that you, you can show that, like, like your friend that you described at the beginning, you can show that you don't need the experts and you can fire them, which your friend did um, uh, at, at his or her peril. Uh, well, they, they're expensive, you know. <laughs> what? They're expensive. Experts are expensive, but but sometimes they're cheaper than systems. I mean, you, you cited this example of, of Amtrak, right? And I remember this Amtrak exam. I was actually, um, I was actually working with a, a European railroad company at the time, and they were trying to figure out what to learn from this Amtrak a disaster. And at the time, I think Amtrak said, well, we don't have the $8 billion to, to put in place all of these crash protection systems. And if Congress would just give us the 8 billion, then, you know, we, we would be able to put this in place. And, and I remember thinking like, why can't you just take an Android phone and, and, you know, strap it into the, into the, you know, into the train and uh, with, with some GPS, you know, and, uh, and then that's what you describe in, in your piece. Like, you know, that's, that seems like a, a cheap way to use tech, combine the use of technology with, with, you know, human decision-making uh, and it's, going to do probably almost just as good as some kind of automated $8 billion system. Right. Just for, for listeners who aren't familiar with this example, it was a, an Amtrak that, that, that um, just, uh, derailed. And uh, the reason was that the engineer was distracted and thought he knew where he was but he got uh, he, he got confused about where he was, and there were no displays in the engine cab showing him where he was. I mean, we have those displays in our cars, and we're driving all kinds of routes these days. A train track doesn't move. I mean, a train track is fixed. This is this would be sorry about that ping. This would be you know really very very easy to be able to. Uh, uh, to, to establish, and yet the, the solution was, let, let's replace the engineer's judgment with the technology. Now, there's this one image that, that recurs in your, in your book, in the last couple of books, which is, you know, the, the down arrow and the up arrow, right? And, you know, if we want to make uh, good decisions, on the one hand, we, we want, want to reduce errors. And I think the machine learning approach is, is all about error reduction, Right. So, you know, whether it's least squared errors, I mean, whatever, whenever we're evaluating these models, it's all about kind of, you know, error minimization. But then there's other side to the whole decision making um, approach, which involves increasing the number of, of, of insights. Now, are, are these, 
are these related? Can we, can we talk about, um, you know, if we spend too much time focused on reducing errors, we're going to drive out the insights is, is having some error, positive error rate, the, the price that we have to pay for insights or, or can we look at these separately and, and, you know, minimize one, maximize the other? Ideally, we could do what you're saying is keep them separate and, and, and work on them both independently. But in a practical situation, they, they are related. Because if you if you think about reducing errors in, in, in the safety community, this is often referred to as safety one these days. And, and, and it means who, who, what's a source of error? It's, it's human judgment, um, human mistakes. And so we want to constrain the human. We want to automate as much as possible. We want to rely on checklists as much as possible. And we, we want to take all these steps that are going to make it harder to gain expertise. Um, uh, ideally, it would be possible to build expertise without making real errors. That's why these scenario-based approaches where you can gain vicarious experiences are so attractive. But let's look at football because um, uh, you look at quarterbacks and, and, and they have one of the metrics for a quarterback rating is interceptions. And you want a quarterback who never throws interceptions. Well, I could pass that test. I could, I could apply to be a backup quarterback for an NFL team. I can never throw an interception. I just take the snap from center and I just throw the ball into the ground and I'm, I'm not making any, any, any well, I think any that would count as an interception. I think you got to kneel down. I got to kneel down. Well, it will count as intentional grounding, but I don't know why they don't, whatever the case to be a quarterback, you, you want to take those kinds of chances. You, quarterback who never throws an interception is probably not stretching the boundaries and is not taking enough chances and enough gambles. And you can do it in intelligent ways or more or less intelligent ways, but you don't want somebody who is so worried about not throwing any interceptions that they're, they're not taking those kinds of chances for the big plays, which, which the, the top quarterbacks are able to pull off. Yeah. And I think somewhere in one of the essays, you talk about how, you know, a good expert um, learns from mistakes and, and learns from errors and then, you know, seeks out obstacles and oftentimes, you know, seeks out errors, right? So if your, if your algorithm doesn't have any, any errors, then it's, it's not learning, right? <laughs> I mean, you, you know, do, do we, so is, how can you have sort of an, an optimal, error path? Is it about seeking out those leverage points, right? Because you talk about leverage points. And I love this example. When, when I teach courses on innovation and entrepreneurship, that's a big part of the course, teaching people how to fail cheaply, but to um, have as many of these cheap failures as possible that provide some some insight and some some learning. Right. So you, you want people to learn from feedback but it's not that trivial because a lot, a lot of times I see people say, yeah, we're going to provide feedback about whether you succeeded or not, but that's just the beginning. You also want to help people diagnose why they got it wrong, what they were misinterpreting, what they were missing that they should have been watching more carefully. And so there's that diagnostic part, which gets into the tacit knowledge, which Sometimes people can do by themselves. Sometimes you want to bring in another pair of eyes or, or somebody with more, more expertise to help you unpack, why did I get that wrong? Or what, was there something I could have done that would have prevented this? So you, you want to have that kind of uh, opportunity for a diagnosis to, to help get, get richer feedback rather than just, I got it right or I got it wrong. That's a, a slow not particularly effective way of learning. Yeah. And you talked about how you can use this in, in teaching, right? So, you know, the best way to teach is not to simply correct someone when they make a mistake, but to have them 
walk through the process of understanding their mistakes. Right. You want them to be able to do this kind of self-diagnosis and you want them to, uh, to take that as part of their mindset so that when they leave the class, they're still, they're still curious. And, and some people, if they make a mistake, say, okay, I'm putting it behind me. But the real experts don't put the mistakes behind them. They're, they, they're really upset about these mistakes and they keep mulling about it until they can come up with some idea. Here's what I could have done. Here's what I should have done. And then they, they can start to relax. And that's one of the ways we distinguish the real experts from the ones who are just pretending is you ask people, what's the last mistake you made. And the real experts know the last mistake they made because they're still processing it. And, uh, but the others are, are saying, I can't think of any mistakes. And that's a bad sign. Yeah. And you talk about how the, the best experts are ones that are continuously curious, right? And, right. and so their, their, their knowledge shields are r relatively weak. So why is it that people you know, erect these, these knowledge shields that prevent them from kind of advancing their expertise? Gosh, I've never thought about why the knowledge shields came into, into being. That's the work of Paul Feltovich. And it's really, uh, but, but there, there are others, uh, Chin and Brewer and, and others who have studied these kinds of knowledge shields. And the knowledge shields are ways of um, protecting us and protecting our beliefs because it takes a lot of work to try to change your mind, to change your mental models. And the knowledge shields keep your mental models intact. So it, it, it keeps you in your comfort zone. Whereas the experts are confident enough in themselves and curious enough that they're not only able to go beyond their comfort zone, they look for opportunities to go beyond their comfort zone. They look for the challenges. Right. You said they, they seek out discomfort. They seek out obstacles, right? Right. And, right. And so now, I was once involved in a, in a, a project. There was a, a Freakonomics series that I was recently involved in about, about failure. And uh, what what to what to do about failure? And th there's a common belief that failure is a way to learn, and people should welcome failure and and embrace failure. And and I see that uh, written about a lot. And I don't agree with that. I I don't think failure is a good thing. I don't know about you, Greg, but in my life, when I fail, it hurts. It really bothers me when I when I fail. I don't seek it out. Uh, sometimes I'll go for days or or a week, just sort of grumpy and 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 frustrated and and a little bit frightened. You know, if I fail there, where, where else might I be failing? And and that's adaptive because that keeps the failure in front of my mind. I'm not ready to move on from the failure until I can I can think about. What here's what I should have done. Here's what I could have done. Wow, now I I can't wait for another chance. Whereas before I came to that insight, I was dreading having to be in that situation again. Now, in in this book, uh, seeing what others don't, you talk about becoming uh, an insight hunter, right? Mm -hmm. And also creating an organization, right, which sort of fosters insight hunters. Um, right. So how does one do that? And, you know, why is, why is it so hard? Right. Cause you, you talk about not only what sparks insights, but also, right. What are the obstacles to kind of capitalizing on that spark or, uh, you know, making sense of that spark. Right. And most organizations, if you ask them, they say, we want to foster insights. We want to foster creativity and they believe it, but that's not the way they live. 
because insights are going almost by definition, insights are going to shake up the way you do business. They're going to disorganize you and organizations, even if they say they want more insights, what they really value is predictability. They, they value smoothness. They value um, projects that go along the, the, the predicted lines and uh, don't create lots of turbulence. And th those are easy to manage and everybody uh, can, can relax. And so if, if you come up with an insight and you say, wait a second, we're heading in this direction, but we should be heading in this direction. Oh my gosh, what am I gonna do with that? I've got to reorganize everything. We have our, we have our, 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 our plan. We have our milestones. We have our payment schedule attached to all the milestones. Uh, what, what a pain in the neck that's going to be to make any changes. And so organizations are, they resist insights. They resist the kind of changes that insights demand because insights are disorganizing and they go against the basic core of what, what it means to, to effectively and efficiently run an organization. So what can they do uh, without, uh, you know, ceasing to become an organization? <laughs> what can they do? It's going to take an act of will and it's going to take a uh, buy-in from the very top to accept the inefficiencies that being in, having insight hunters are going to require. And uh, it's gonna start with the board and with the C-suite C uh, level. And uh, I, I once did some work for an organization that started out very innovative and then they became risk averse. And somebody told me that in the past seven years, there had been 50 new ideas for innovation that they could pursue, but the organization had set up murder boards to, to evaluate new concepts and new approaches. And if they, they found any one possible problem or a difficulty, they would turn it down. So of the 50 that had been proposed to them, they didn't fund a single one. They were really risk averse, even though they, they started out being such a dynamic and innovative organization, and they still believe that's who they were because of their, their founding story, but, but that had changed. So organizations, well, what can they do? That They have to accept the inefficiencies that are going to occur with, uh, with the insights. Uh, they've got to change their hierarchical structure because right now if i'm somebody close to the bottom and i come up with a great idea imagine um i go to my boss who goes to his boss and it's got to make it all the way up the chain of command and it only takes one person in that chain of command to kill the idea so you have to have some parallel paths for people to to bypass those kinds of roadblocks you have to change the way you make group decisions. Right now, we often make group decisions by uh, consensus. You know, let's come up with a, an approach that everybody can agree with. I hate the notion of a consensus-based uh, decision-making because consensus means it only takes one person in the decision-making circle to put it, give you a thumbs down and now the idea doesn't go forward. So that gives everybody a veto and it, it reduces uh, the innovation focus. Now, one thing you said is that I think it permeates your work is the importance of, of curiosity, right? And the importance of, of a sense of wonder. But there's one essay where you said you're critical of the idea that um, good ideas and insights come from the swirl, right? <laughs> what you call the swirl, which is, um, you know, you take a bunch of different ideas and you take a bunch of people with different backgrounds and, you know, you, you scramble them and you mix them and you have these kind of random serendipitous encounters. Well, I mean, how do you reconcile those two things? Because one would think that if 
you know, curiosity and wonder is a superpower. Well, then, you know, it has to encounter some, some fresh material in, in order to make discoveries. So what's the problem with this interdisciplinary swirl right, that, that people advocate? Right. And I don't have any data here. I just have my own impression. My own, but I, there, I think there are some data that trying to generate lots and lots of different possibilities and permutations um, doesn't necessarily lead to, to more insights. It leads to more work to try to screen them all out. But that that's a mechanistic approach to coming up with insights. And, and I'm... I'm, my mindset is to be suspicious of mechanistic procedural types of approaches. I uh, I think what 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 instead what you want is an openness to the new ideas that people in the organization surface because typically, especially if they're lower level in the organization, they get marginalized or ignored. And we've seen this again and again, where something happened and somebody in the organization had had warned about it, but was sidelined. And uh, and so a better approach is to take advantage of the the natural curiosity of the people in the organization and, and give them a fair hearing. That doesn't mean that they're always right. And you don't want to waste all your time chasing down every crackpot idea that people come up with, but you don't want to automatically turn them off because they don't have the status in the organization. They haven't earned their spurs. And so you're, you're looking at their, their track record, their credibility, their years of experience, and you're not looking at what they're telling you. You're not taking it seriously and imagining it. And so I think that kind of mindset would go much further than saying, Let's everybody go to the same lunchroom and sit with people you've never seen before and, uh, and, and, and just expose everybody to, to lots and lots of ideas and shake things up that way. I don't see any, any evidence that that's been effective. Well, Gary, you've got a lot of really valuable insights on sources of power and uh, the acquisition of insights. Um, and I think maybe the best place for people to start would be with this latest book, Snapshots of the Mind right? Which covers a lot of your work. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you very much for inviting me. I really appreciate the conversation. Take care. Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution 